and welcome back to another session. Uh, so today we are going to go over the standard operations of the chapter from the treasurer's perspective. My name is Steve Saldivar. I'm the director of finance and accounting here at HFMA, and I will be walking you through this session as well. So first up is the chapter budget. Um, so basically, it is a plan for what the chapter wants, wants to achieve for this fiscal year. Um, chapters are required to complete an annual operating budget. Um, typically, the treasurers would review that with your local board, uh, get buy-in from everyone, approval, and then we need you guys to enter that in QuickBooks. Um, typically, that's required to be in QuickBooks by June 1st. Nothing is required to be sent to the association letting us know, but um, it's great to have it in QuickBooks by the start of the new fiscal year, which as I mentioned is June 1st. Um, so key elements of the budget is obviously the revenue budget, and there's also program and operating expenses, and then if there's any contributions to chapter equity. Okay, so then as we continue to operate throughout the fiscal year, uh, it's the treasurer's responsibility to keep your local board of directors up to date and current on all financial matters. Uh, that includes producing monthly, quarterly financials, including you know your income statement, um, your statement of financial position, statement of cash flow, which all of these can be accessed through QuickBooks. Um, there is another session specifically related to QuickBooks. If you're not sure how to access those statements, uh, I recommend you go take a look at that section. Uh, Perla does a great job of walking you guys through all of the common areas of QuickBooks that you may need and financial statements is one of them. So up next is a certificate of insurance. So you may ask, what is a certificate of insurance and why might I need one? Um, so typically, you know, unfortunately not, not in 2020, um, but typically in, when we're able to have live events, uh, some hotels and venues and things like that want to know that we have, you know, general liability insurance, something basically to cover our end if something were to happen to one of our attendees. Um, so a lot of venues do require it. It basically just details the types of insurance coverage we have, the limits that we have, um, and it basically gives them contact information for our insurance broker. Um, so the association handles insurance for both the association and for the chapters. So if you do find that you need a certificate of insurance, uh, please go ahead and request that from us by sending an email to accounting at hfma.org. Um, we typically ask that you send that request about two weeks before you need it. Uh, we can typically turn that around in about 48 hours, but you know we, we have to send that request to our broker. Um, so it's really out of our hands how long it takes them, but they typically respond within 48 hours as well. So what information do we need? Uh, here's a list here. I won't go through all of them, but this is the typical information that, that we would require from you. Um, you know, one is when you need it by, you know, the name of your event, the name and um, address of the facility. Uh, so typically with this information, we can go ahead and get you a certificate of insurance. Uh, the only thing that's not on here, oh, I guess it is, number four is the type of coverage required by the facility. Some facilities are very specific in what they wanna see. Um, you know, they want to be a named insured on the certificate or they want their parent company to be a named insured. If there's any specific details written in your contract of, you know, what is needed on the certificate, um, please go ahead and provide that to us as well. And we'll be sure that uh, we get that on there. OK, so up next is 1099 NEC reporting. Um, this is formerly the 1099 miscellaneous uh, chap. Uh, we, we provide a much more thorough a webinar on this later in the year when it comes time to um, completing the 1099s, which is typically sometime in January. These are typically due by January 31st. Uh, but this is just a high level overview of the 1099 process. Um, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna be able to understand the 1099 NEC, um, who needs to do it, how to fill it out, and then some QuickBooks reporting as well. So as I mentioned, the new 1099 NEC is formerly 1099 miscellaneous. You'll notice over here on the left, box seven of 1099 miscellaneous used to be non-employee compensation. You'll see here for 2020, that form was updated and box seven is no longer non-employee compensation. So that's where the 1099 NEC comes from. And if you were wondering what the NEC stands for, it's non-employee compensation. So there's a brand new form as of 2020 that is the 1099 NEC. So the 
box you will now use is box one to report any non-employee compensation. Um, so what do we mean by non-employee compensation? So these are payments that you made to someone who's not your employee. Uh, the payments are made for services in the course of your normal trader business. Uh, in terms of the chapters, it would typically be for like a, a speaking fee or you know any kind of third party consultant that you may have had. And uh, the limit is $600. So if you didn't pay them more than $600, um, you won't have to worry about filing a 1099 NEC. But if you did pay them more than that, um, a 1099 NEC will be required for that independent contractor. So this is just a high level. Um, when you purchase your packet of 1099 NECs, you can get that at your local Office Max or Office Depot. Um, you know, they sell them all over. You could even order them online. Uh, but there's a number of copies that come in that packet. Uh, so copy A in the 1096 forms are for the IRS. Um, copy one is for the state tax departments. Uh, the one difference with the 1099 NEC is that you guys are required to file to your state uh, the difficult part there is each state has its own requirements. There is not one federal requirement for everyone. Um, so look, look into your state requirements. Some states require you to do it. Um, some states don't require filing if you didn't withhold anything. And it's not typical that we would withhold any taxes. Um, so take a look at your local state requirements and then uh, determine if you need to file with the state or not. And then copy B or copy two um, are for the independent contractor themselves. And then copy C is for you to go ahead and keep for your own records. So for filing due dates, so the 1099 NEC is due by January 31st. Um, there's no automatic 30 day extension, but again, with the states, uh, most of the states follow the January 31st as well. Um, there are a few that give some leeway there at least from our own experience, there were a few that are due on February 15th, um, one that's not even due until March 1st. Um, so again, uh, from a state perspective, take a look at your local state requirements and um, see what the exact deadline is there because each state is different for the 1099 and EC. Uh, so QuickBooks is going to be a great resource in filing the 1099 NECs. Uh, there are a number of reports that you can use in QuickBooks. So if you see here, if you just go to the left navigation panel in QuickBooks, there's a report section. Once you click on that, under the expense and vendor section, there's 1099 transaction detail, check detail, expenses by vendor summary. So those reports will help you in identifying which vendors need a 1099 um, form sent and completed for them. Uh, one thing to remember is in order to use those QuickBooks reports, you need to be sure that your vendors are set up properly when you're setting them up and maintained properly as you, you know, continue throughout the years. Uh, and the first part of that is getting a W-9 from each one of your vendors. So every time you get a new vendor, start paying someone new, we should be requesting a W-9 for them. So what the W-9 does for us is it verifies a number of things, including the name of their business. Are they operating under a social security number or an actual tax ID? Um, it verifies their business type. You know, are they an individual, a C corporation, a partnership? Um, there's a number of them listed there. Um, so these, this W-9 will help you to determine whether they need a 1099. For example, an individual would need a 1099, whereas someone who's operating as a C corp wouldn't need a 1099. And again, those additional details are, um, we run through those thoroughly in the 1099 presentation later in the year. So this was just high level overview. I hope this was helpful to you. Um, again, just maintaining your vendors will, will help a great deal when it comes to reporting 1099s. Um, as far as I know, a number of the chapters do not report 1099s. There's no need for it. So I think this is uh, for a small subset of you. But if you do want additional information before the, the 1099 webinar that comes later in the year, uh, feel free to reach out to us at accounting at hfma.org. And we can certainly provide you with a copy of those slides and we can answer any additional questions you may have. But that is it for this session. Um, I hope that was helpful for you and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thanks so much.